<laughs> G'day folks, I'm Mick from Sale from Ironman 4x4. Let's discuss the controversial subject of bull bars, underbody plates, side steps, battery equipment, canopies, roof racks, sliding systems, water storage, additional fuel, everything that can be done. Dun, 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 dun. G'day folks, I'm Mick van Sale from Ironman 4x4. Those of you who followed our Iron Van build will recall that during the suspension fitment episode, I briefly discussed suspension spaces and I noted that we were going to be doing a proper in-depth video about that. Here we are. So what I'm going to be showing you today is where these suspension spaces are fitted, why people fit them and the inherent dangers of fitting these suspension spaces and why we suggest you don't fit them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to lift the iron van up into the air, get the wheels off and I'm first going to show you what the front suspension looks like, all the components of the suspension, the geometry of the movement of the wheel and how the suspension spaces affects that and actually causes some of the problems I've been talking about. So we've popped the wheels off and I'm going to show you the various components on the front suspension of the Hilux. It's important to note that this design of suspension on the front is typical of just about every single four-wheel drive on sale in South Africa. All your double cab buckies, excepting the very old Nissan NP300, um, some of the uh, Indian vehicles feature old torsion bar suspensions, but pretty much all the rest of them have this coil over strut independent front end suspension. The main components consist of uh, some control arms, upper control arm, lower control arm. These control arms locate the wheel assembly onto the chassis of the vehicle, so it's not done by the coil spring or the shock absorber. Next we have the shock absorber, which is this fella in here. This is what the standard Hilux shock absorber looks like. It has a bushing at the bottom which fits onto the uh, control arm with this bolt through there and it can move radially as the control arm is moving up and down. This is the spring seat um, on the Ironman shock it's over there that's where the coil spring rests on and then over here you have the upper pin. Now the pin accommodates a strut cap which is this fella over here and you can see that the coil spring is now going to fit between these two uh, points here and that it gives us this fella over here, which is quite heavy. Uh, this is a standard French strut on this Hilux. So shock absorber, coil spring, strut cap. What's important to note is this strut cap is the point where this assembly is mounted onto the vehicle. And this chassis bracket over here, this metal here is part of the chassis, and this strut assembly actually pushes up into there and bolts on from the top. I'll just point out a couple of other components on the front suspension which are important to take note of. Firstly is your steering system. This is a rack end, a tie rod end, and it connects to the steering rack. That's your steering on the front. And then over here we have the drive shaft which is used for four-wheel driving and it drives the front wheels. This is a CV joint system, so it has an inner and an outer CV joint. Uh, constant velocity joint and that allows drive to go to the wheels even while the wheels are going up and down independently. So there are limits to the upward and the downward movement of your front wheels, there has to be. Uh, the lower limit which we call the droop limit or the droop stop is determined actually by the length of the strut on the front of the suspension. And then the upward movement uh, or the bump is limited by a bump stop rubber. That's a rubber that sits over here and as your wheel comes up it comes into contact with a plate on the lower control arm and that stops the wheel from going too high and, and contacting the body of the vehicle. So we have a bump stop limit and we have a droop stop limit. It's very important to note those two points because we're going to get back to them when we start discussing the old spacer there. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to take this strut out here and I'm going to be putting a strut back in without a spring so that I can show you what those limits of travel look like. So guys, an important thing when working with suspension is that you record the measurements. These are typically the ride heights of the vehicles and perhaps even checking how much gaps you've got between the spring seat and the upper spring cap. 
measure the stuff, record it, do your suspension fitment and refer back to it afterwards. So in this spacer video and checking what effect the spacer has on our measurements, let's actually record the measurements. And there's three measurements that I want to record. The first one I want to record will be our typical droop distance. And I'm going to take that from this point on the fender down to an approximation of the center of the wheel here. Um, it's going to be difficult to determine what that center is. So we'll just actually make a mark that we'll use. It doesn't matter if it's not in the middle, as long as we measure to the same point, that's what's important. So I'm just going to draw a line like that. And then if we just measure that distance there, I'm getting, well, 585 millimeters, let's call it that. And, and of course, we're writing this down, 585, standard strut, no spacer fitted. The next measurement I want to take is the gap between the upper and the lower portion of the spring seats. And that's just on 300 millimeters, which we'll record again. And then the last measurement I want to take, which is quite an important one, and for that I need to just compress the suspension. So the last measurement will be, under full compression, how much space is there between the upper spring cap and the lower spring seat? And I'll explain that in a second. So we've raised the suspension right up to the bump stop. It's just starting to squish the bump stop. There's more to go, but I don't obviously want to topple the vehicle off the hoist. So now we measure this over here. And I have measured this before. And it's around 220 millimeters, we'll record that. I'm going to show you that fitting a suspension spacer on top of the strut is actually going to rob some of that space. The important thing is that a typical Hilux coil spring with a wire thickness of about 18 millimeters, 11 windings, gives you a collapsed solid length of just shy of 200 mils. Call it 200 mils to be on the safe side. We've got 220 mils here, so that gives us 20 millimeters of safety margin. That ends up being the gap between your coils when the suspension is fully compressed. And you need those gaps because as soon as that coil spring is compressed totally, that's solid metal and there's no more give. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pop that strut out and I'm going to be fitting the spacer on top of it, put it back into place and then we'll retake those measurements. So we're now gonna be redoing the measurements just to compare it to what it was before. Droop length is now, call it 630-ish. I'll just note that down. The gap between the upper and lower spring seat should not have changed, and it is indeed just on 300 mils as it was before. But the critical one is the gap that you would have under full compression. So to measure that, we're just gonna pop this back up again until the bump stop comes into play like it was last time. There. So the bump stop's a little compressed. We don't want to tilt the vehicle off the hoist. So if we measure this distance here now, we've got just on 195 millimeters. Let's just go back to our coil spring. It had 18 millimeters of wire thickness at 11 windings. That gives you a solidly compressed length of around 198 mils. You only have 195 mils worth of available space when the bump stop is just starting to come into play. What that means is that your coil spring under full compression becomes your bump stop. That's solid metal. It's not a soft rubber bump stop and something is going to break. So that, folks, is the issue with fitting a suspension spacer on top of the strut when it comes to fully compressing the suspension. Let's just go the other way and drop this wheel down as far as it'll go with that spacer attached to the top, with the strut longer than it's supposed to be. And there are really two issues here. The first issue is that this upper ball joint over here becomes overextended. I'm just gonna drop this down as far as it'll go Right, we're at the droop extremity of the suspension now with the longer strut fitted. And what we're doing now is we have this upper ball joint right on the edge of its rotation. It can't go any further. If you now drop this further down, you're actually overextending the ball joint. You're gonna pull the ball pin out or you might actually crack the upper control arm, which we've seen before. 
Fact of the matter is, this is the upper mounting point of your wheel. When this fails, your wheel is gonna either fall in or fall out. If that happens at speed on the road, well, I don't need to tell you what the dire consequences of that will be. The other issue that we're gonna have here at the droop extremity, which is now increased by this length, is that we're overextending the angle of the inner CV joint. That CV joint is a tripod system. It doesn't like to be overextended. Um, and in fact, it will wear out very quickly. They become damaged very quickly when they operate outside of that angle. So those are the two issues you're gonna have with uh, this increase in droop length, having fitted the spacer. So folks, in short, uh, and as simply as I could, I've tried to show you what the issue is with fitting these spacers. You end up with not enough space for compressing your spring, and under extension, you overextend some of the components which can cause an accident. It's dangerous, it's not a good idea. It's a life and limb part that you're messing with. These parts, when they fail, are life and limb parts. You can lose life or limb, it is serious. I must say, however, if you drive a two-wheel drive and you drive around uh, town and you don't do any four-wheel driving, you probably could get away with fitting a spacer and with no ill effect. But certainly, if you're a four-wheel driver, if you're an overlander, here at Ironman 4x4, our advice has always been, do not fit spacers. They can be very dangerous.